This is problem 5-6, and in all of these problems 1 through 9, there's a general statement that says that we need to compute the maximum, minimum stress, mean stress, alternating stress, stress ratio, and make a plot of stress versus time. So let me read the details of problem 6, and then we'll get into working it. A part of the structure for a factory automation system is a beam that spans 30 inches, as shown in the figure. We'll draw that in just a second. Loads are applied at two points, each uh, 8 inches from a support. The left load is 1,800 pounds, remains constantly applied. The right load uh, is also 1,800 pounds, but it's applied and removed frequently as the machine cycles. We're supposed to evaluate the beam at both B and C. Might help if you know what the beam looks like. So if we draw the beam, there's support at either end, just simply supported. This is point A, this is point D, because there are two other forces. Now, F1 is applied constantly and is 1,800 pounds force. F2 varies between 0 to 1,800 pounds force. Now, they are 8 inches from the end, so if we plot, you know, a point B and a point C for the location, the overall beam is 30 inches long, so B and C are, you know, 8 inches from their ends, and then the remaining distance between is 14 inches. Because 8 and 8 is 16 plus 14 gives us a 30 inch beam. Okay, so there's a setup for it. It's just this one, though, that varies. The other one does not vary. Now, the cross section of this beam, uh, if you look at it, it is given, I don't think they mentioned it in the problem statement, but in the uh, figure, they said that this is four by two by quarter steel tube. So four by two by essentially quarter steel tube. The only thing is, while you could, you know, you might think, well, I'm gonna draw it like this. I'm going to uh, realize there's some area out of it because we've got a quarter inch wall and set it up and calculate the moment of inertia for the second moment of area. Uh, that's really not the easiest way to do it. The better thing to do is just look up this beam and look up its properties. In particular, what we want is the moment of inertia about this axis I, Y, is the way it's listed in, in the text. So when you look that up, you find that this is 1.48 inches, uh, not squared, sorry, to the fourth power. So 1.48 inches to the fourth power, and we'll use that in just a little while. So we're supposed to evaluate the stresses at B and C. Now, understand the stress at B and C will both vary, right? Because this force here causes stress over here, just like it causes stress beneath the force. So we have to analyze uh, both points. The first thing I'm going to do is take care of the statics and find out the reaction loads. Of course, uh, when we have a force, let's see, let me figure out how I want to lay this out. Let's do it this way. When uh, the force at position 2 or F2 at C is 0, well then we can sum moments about A, taking counterclockwise as positive. Uh, this would be gone, right? So if we sum moments about A, we'd have a negative 8, and I'm going to drop the units because I'm going to work in inches and pounds force, that way it'll all be consistent. But F1 is causing a negative moment opposite my sine direction. So 1800, 8 inches, 1800 pounds, and then the only reaction to counteract that moment is the reaction D. So plus uh, 30 inches times the reaction at D will have to come out to zero because the beam is static. Now, I'm not going to go through the details. Obviously, RD will come out in pounds force, and there's a little bit of algebra, but RD then is equal to 480 pounds force. If you do the same thing, some moments say about D to get A or some moments about B, you know, using our now known reaction at D. In fact, let me go ahead and label them that way. If you do that, you can find the reaction at A or you can sum forces in the y direction, but it's better to sum moments again about another point and then check with some forces. I've already done all that. I came out with a reaction at A equal to 1320 pounds force. Okay? So if you add all that together, some forces, it does make sense. It's 1800 pounds. Now that's when the force at 2 is 0. Now when the force here at C is 1800 pounds, then the reactions are trivial, right? I mean, this is a, a symmetrical beam, so 
the reactions would be 1,800 pounds in both places. So that one we don't even really need statics for. So let's go ahead and work with, um, let's see, I think I'm going to flip it around from what I did in my sheet because I've got F2 equals 0 over here. So if you think about the beam when F2 is applied at 1,800 pounds, like I said, it's trivial. So we can just go and draw the shear and bending moment uh, diagrams directly. They're very simple in that case. So um, looking at the length along the beam, obviously the shear initially will go up to 1,800 pounds force. We'll remain constant. We'll go down to zero, then constant until we reach C. Okay. And then go down to negative 1,800 and then back up at the reaction here. So negative 1,800 pounds force, positive 1,800. This is not really a difficult uh, shear moment diagram problem to solve. If I calculate the moment in inch pounds, then that's pretty simple as well. All I need is this area. So I need 8 inches multiplied by 1,800 pounds. It just increases linearly. And so, anyway, 8 times 1,800 comes out to uh, 14,400 inch pounds force. That just continues constant and then goes to zero. Over here, because this area is equal to that area. So the, the shear and moment diagram in the case where F2 is 1,800 pounds is pretty straightforward. What about when F2 is equal to zero? Well, then we could draw a shear diagram, again, in pounds force. But this time, let's see, the shear, uh, as we're going across, let's say, here's A. The shear is going to go up to whatever RA is. Well, RA is 1320. So this goes up instead of to the 1800 we had before. It only goes up to 1320 pounds force. And then that will go across constantly until we reach point B. And at point B, remember F1 is still 1800 pounds. So it has to drop down below the axis. It's 1800 pounds. In fact, it will drop down to 480 not to scale, 480 pounds worth, negative because we're in the compressive region, uh, well, not because it's compressive, but because our, our shear direction is flipped. Anyway, so then we go on over, there's nothing at C, we can plot it, but nothing changes there because there's no force applied at C. So then we just keep going on until we finally reach D, and of course the, the force at D is 480 pounds and this goes to zero as we would expect. Now the moment in inch pounds force. Uh, let's see, that one's pretty straightforward as well. All we need is this area, so we need 8 inches. It's still the same distance, right? It's still 8 inches, but now times 1320. So the moment doesn't go up quite as high in this case where F2 is zero. In fact, the moment only goes up to 10,560 inch pounds force. That's what 8 multiplied by uh, 1320 comes out to is 10,000. 560. And if you calculate this area, which is what, 14 plus 8 is 22 inches, right? 22 inches multiplied by the 480 pounds, you get the exact same number, 10,560. So this comes down to zero here, and our diagram is complete for both. We've got shear and moment diagrams for both cases when F2 is applied and when it's relieved. Okay, now that was just the statics and, you know, uh, simple calculations portion. Notice that there's one thing we need. We actually need the moment at this point. And the reason we need it is because the stress at point B, where we're supposed to analyze, varies because the moment varies from 10,560 to 14,400. But at C, the stress varies more, right? Because here, the maximum moment is 14,400 but it drops down to some other value here. So we better calculate the value of the moment there. And that's pretty easy because all we got to do is take the moment we had 10,560, which is this area, and subtract off this area, you see. So all we have to do is, and I, I did the math, I just did it on my diagram. So this is, uh, let's see, I'll pull it back, 10,560 inch pounds force, that's this area, minus this area, so, minus 480 times that distance. Well, the distance between B and C is still 14 inches, 
So times 14, they're all consistent units, so I won't worry too much about the units. Anyway, that comes out to a moment of, let's see, 3,840 at this point. Okay, so I don't really need this anymore. I'm just trying to label here that the resulting moment is 3,840 inch pounds. So now we know the minimum moment and the maximum moment at point C, and we know the minimum moment and maximum moment at point B. So now we can successfully at, uh, analyze both points. So let's see, I guess let's work uh, at B over here since B is more to the left than the B. And understand we're going to take information from both, you know what, let's do it this way. Let's change colors for human factors. Uh, we're going to take, uh, you know what, I bet the red will show up better. So at B, we're going to take this point and this point and analyze the stresses. All right, so what stress are we talking about? Well, it's true that there is shear at this point, but there's also a moment, and the moment is going to give rise to a large uh, normal force that is a, a bending, it's a result of bending, right? And remember that that force, that, or that uh, stress, I'm sorry, that bending stress, is going to end up being at the top and bottom of the beam, right? Whereas the shear stress would be maximum in the center. And since usually shear stress is not what causes beams to fail, especially if you're not out at the, the very ends where the reactions are located, well then I think we should just not worry about the, the shear stress due to the shear load and only concentrate on the moment. So what we're dealing with here is a, a sigma type thing, right? An MC over I. Now fortunately we already have I. We looked that up. Uh, C is pretty simple because it's just the half height, right? I guess I could have put that in black, it doesn't matter. Uh, but then the moment is whatever moment we've got. So to calculate the minimum, let me get rid of this, to calculate the minimum bending stress, we plug in the minimum moment, well that's 10,560 pounds force. Now I'm going to be very careful about my units, make sure they work out. I need C, the half height, well that's just one inch, divided by uh, IY, 1.48 inches to the fourth. And I realize I've made a mistake because I go inches and inches to the fourth here, that would end up with inches cubed. I wrote pounds force, didn't I? I should have written inch pounds force. So I'll just sneak it in there. So now we have inches times inches over inches to the fourth. That will end up giving us inches squared in the denominator and we'll have PSI, which is what we want. So for the minimum stress, that comes out to uh, about 7,135 uh, PSI. And uh, let's see, I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to put my diagram. Uh, maybe I'll just put them right here. There's space. Okay, so there's uh, the minimum stress, the maximum stress at B. Well, that would be 14,400 pounds force inch. Again, same thing. I could have just scaled the minimum stress. It doesn't matter. I'll get the same thing. Okay. Uh, I was going to drop the units because I know the units will come out okay. Anyway, this is, uh, and I'm sorry, I've got, no, I've got that right. So this is the maximum. That's right, because it's the maximum moment. So this comes out to about 9,730 PSI. Okay, so there's a maximum and minimum. If we put these two together, we can get the stress ratio, which is 0 0.733. It's non-dimensional, of course. We can get the uh, average or mean stress as the maximum plus minimum bending stress over 2. Add these two together, divide by 2, in other words, and you get about 8,433. PSI. On the other hand, the amplitude of stress is the maximum stress minus minimum stress over 2. And that comes out, I rounded it off all, so that comes out to, or maybe I didn't. Anyway, it comes out, what I've got is 1298. And I don't remember if I rounded that off or not. It doesn't really matter. There it is. So now we can draw the variation of stress, let's see, 
Well, let me make sure I've got this right. Yeah, the moment's positive, so bending stress, yeah, it's not fully reverse bending stress. So I'll just draw it uh, like this. So the stress versus time, let's see, minimum uh, 71.35, and these are PSI. Maximum uh, 97.30 PSI. Mean stress or average 84.33. Yeah, 84.33. And then the stress amplitude, the 12.98 is just the difference between these, okay? So the variation in stress would look something like this. I don't know the exact shape of it. That doesn't matter. That's not what we're interested in. We're just interested in the average stress, the amplitude of stress, which is right here at 1298, and then the maximum and minimum stress. So that takes care of our analysis at B. Now we're supposed to analyze point C as well. So let's get rid of all this. I probably should not have, but I want it to be in the right color. So let's use green for this. So now, yeah, let's not try blue. I think blue will write better. There we go. So now let's see. At point C, again, it's the same thing, right? We need the maximum stress, and that's pretty easy because it's just. Uh, let's see, 14,400 times 1 inch over 1.48. We've actually already done this, right? We're going to get the exact same maximum stress at C that we had at B because all the numbers are the same. So that maximum stress just comes out to 97, 30 or so PSI. Now the minimum stress is a little bit different. Uh, instead of plugging it in, I guess what I'll do is scale the maximum because look, the moment goes down to 3840. So can't I just take sigma max and multiply it by 3840 over 14,400, right? When you do that, you come up with a minimum stress of about 2,595 PSI. Okay? For some reason, my, I seem to be running out of space more this time, so let me move over. Calculate the stress ratio. Well, we're just going to take the minimum over the maximum, so 25.95 over 97.30, and that comes out to a stress ratio of 0 0.267. I should have noted the stress ratio before. I, I don't remember if I wrote it down or not, but if you calculate you know, the, the minimum over maximum stress for point B, that ratio comes out to 0 0.733. Now our stress ratio is lower. Is 0.267, but that's actually a bad thing, right? That means that there's a worse stress condition for the material at B. So let's see, uh, what else? Well, how about the mean stress? Again, just the maximum plus the minimum stress divided by two. You've got the maximum and minimum, 97, 30, 25, 95. Add them, divide by two, and you'll find that the mean stress is about 6,163 PSI, and I have an idea. Just realized what I can do. What about, what about if the red goes with B? And we'll make this graph a little bit more accurate, because remember the zero is going to be pretty far down here. And then what I'll do is draw the curve in blue for the stress at C. Anyway, so 6163 PSI, that's the minimum stress. So that's going to be, <clears throat> you know, maybe right about here. Hopefully this doesn't become too messy. We don't really need this anymore, so let me get it out of the way. So 6163 is going to be the stress, uh, the uh, uh, mean stress at B. Trying to make things black that are not associated with a particular point. And then the amplitude of stress variation would be the maximum stress minus the minimum stress divided by 2. That comes out to uh, about 
3568 psi. Now notice that the maximum stress for Kc is exactly the same, right? So 9730 psi is the maximum stress. This is just the mean stress, the minimum stress is way down here at 2,900 or 2,500 and 95. So not exactly the scale, but you know, hopefully not too bad. And so there's our, I probably should move that down a little bit. So our stress variation at point B is more like this. Now I don't care about the phase of the, the variation. That's not what I'm trying to get at here. I'm trying to contrast these two and point out that while the average stress at point C is lower than the average stress at point B, the variation in stress at B or at C is a lot higher than the variation in stress at point uh, 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 B. So counterintuitively, it turns out that the stress condition at C is worse than the stress condition at B. You wouldn't think so, right? Because you look at it and you say, well, we're still talking about tensile stress here or compressive stress, whichever the case may be, whether you're looking at the top or the bottom of the beam. Bottom would be in tension, top and compression. And you might say, well, it looks to me like this would be the worst case scenario because it's like there's this constant high load there. But the point of fatigue is that the variation in stress can actually cause more damage. And so that's what we would see here. Even though the average stress is lower, it's this amplitude uh, that really causes the damage and causes the problem. So we've analyzed both point B and C. We've got the uh, stress conditions there, the maximum, minimum, the mean, the amplitude, and the stress ratio. And that's what we were asked to find in this problem.